you know, when, when I hear somebody's demo, I can tell what the finished record should be and what the components should be. Mm -hmm. And I make a decision off that about, we need this kind of studio, this kind of room, these kind of microphones. I've gone so far as saying, this one should be done on, in mono on a cassette, for, for example. Or this should be done on four track, mm -hmm. this will be appropriate for eight. Um, in this situation here in the studio, I'll probably end up using maybe nine tracks in total. Uh, and I know I can use, how many does it say? I think I can go like, you know, 32 tracks. I'll use nine. Yeah. Is that because you want people to play live and you capture a live performance primarily? Feel is everything. I, I wouldn't say necessarily live performance in, in, with the connotations that has. I meant like a kind of a real performance as a Yeah. Right, as, as opposed to a, a layered, uh, yeah. let's get the drums right and add everything else. What you want is the, um, the rapport between the musicians, so that you get that little bit of extra, a little bit of spark. Um, and like, if you look at classic records, they all have it. There's all like, a, a, you know, the X ingredient that, that transcends, the, you know, the components. Um, so you're always looking to get that. And, you know, listen to Little Richard and it's like, it's instantaneous and it's like, massive um, and yet it was just done in mono in like probably like two minutes you know mm. but the feel is like unbeatable and that you know and I think from a listener's point of view you know regardless of, of the era in which a record was made if it communicates the feeling and the energy in the right way then it becomes timeless and I think we're always looking to make a record that's going to stay around for a long time you know and stay on the shelves for a bit it's more of a challenge to, to use less rather than more. Of course. Um, the fewer components you have means that like, every note that you have counts for more because there's less on there. By the same token, every note that you end up with has got more impact and more power and means more. Um, that's the ethos of let's do it in two track or let's do it in mono or let's restrict ourselves to four tracks so that everything counts. And there's nothing wasted and there's no flab and there's nothing to take away from what is the real core feel of the song. Because it's, it's all about communicating feelings to the listener. You know, if a record makes you feel something, I go out and buy it. That's different from listening to it thinking, oh, that's nice. You know, what makes people put their hands in their pocket to buy it is like, that makes me feel something you know, uh, significant. So I want to own that piece of music because it'll make me feel like that every time I listen to it. And that's the key thing. Without being contentious, can I say in a way you, you're like a punk producer in in in, in essence. In well, you know, it's like everybody's using technology up to here, so instinctively I want to do the opposite thing. Yeah. You know, and I want I wanted to see can I make a cassette, uh, make a make a record with one microphone and a cassette that's commercially viable or fits its market or is appropriate. And I think probably it's more than anything else, it's a question of appropriateness. Um, is this sonic appropriate to this kind of music? That, that's the overriding thing. And in some instances, yes, I would use Cubase, I would use Pro Tools, and I have, and I still do. Um, it all depends what it is you're doing. I mean, I wouldn't do a club record, you know, with a cassette and one microphone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but likewise, I wouldn't want to record a rustic album, you know, in Oysterville, or a garage album um, on Pro Tools. It wouldn't make any sense. So it's a question of just using, you know, the most appropriate tools for the work that you're supposed to be doing. The record business is suffering a lot because of people downloading and so... Oh, that's what they say. I mean, it's true, you know, lots of people download stuff because they can. Um, lots of people used to tape music from the radio because they could. Um, you know anybody who kept all the cassette tapes that they taped off the radio in the 70s? I don't. You know, and the same would be true of downloads. You delete them after a bit because they're not permanent. What happens is the stuff that you like and you enjoy and that you would actually put your money down for is the stuff that you want to like and want to keep, um, which is a, a far less proportion than what you're able to download or listen to online. Um, True, you know, there's piracy, if there's this, there's that, there's the other associated with it. Um, and it's also true that copyright legislation is not in place in the way that it should be um, to fairly compensate the artist even legally for what's going on, let alone the legal downloads. Um, it's also true to say that uh, with the recent success of iTunes that they've demonstrated in a very big way that money can be made and that people are prepared to pay for music online. 
So I think the future of the industry is twofold. I think we're going to see a big divide between what we will call top 40 music and everything else. Um, on the one hand, top 40 stuff will remain in the kind of position it is now, um, with the same kind of money being put behind it. And it will be you know, marketed demographically, much in the way it is now, if not more so, with very high budgets and blockbuster mentality towards it. The other 98% of music that's out there will be able to be marketed to its own particular niche. Um, and online ways of selling and distributing music uh, provide the ideal answer for that. So basically anybody who's selling you know, less than half a million records, all I can see is they're going to be doing it online. Mm. Uh, many of them independently, I think. Uh, when artists wake up to the fact that you know, if they sold 50,000 albums with a record label, um, they have a listener base of 50,000 that they can draw on, then what's the point of having a record label because you can sell it to your fans directly? Because once you've got the mailing list with your fans, they're going to buy your next one. Um, the music in, the, in specific niches tends to have uh, a more loyal core of buyers than Top 40 stuff does. So it seems to me we're going to have kind of a two-tier industry, probably within five years. Where would you like to be in, say, ten years' time? What would you like to have accomplished? That's a hard one, isn't it? Um, all you ever want to do is make the best records you can make um, with whatever artist you're working with. You know, I'm not too bothered whether I'm working with some big name artist or not. It's more a matter of, you know, do I connect with the material? You know, uh, is it something that my contribution to is really worthwhile doing? Um, and in some ways, if I'm doing well enough to be able to make a choice about who I can work with, that's fine. Uh, I've been fortunate enough, you know, by and large, to be able to do that. Mm. So I may not have this, big, you know, a really high profile or anything, but I have had the pleasure of working with people that, you know, I wanted to work with, rather than, oh, I've got to knock out another single today, you know, to pay the bills with. So it's been good in that sense.